everybody. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for uh, your invitation and, uh, and for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today for, for this. I will try to give a brief update about the virus that affects us all. Um, and basically, um, afterwards, I will share with you some of our uh, strategy of how we think we can target this virus and perhaps uh, help somehow to stop this uh, this outbreak. Uh, a few words about myself before I begin. So um, first of all, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I'm not a physician. I'm not a clinician. I'm a researcher. Um, I carry out basic and translational immunological uh, research on viruses and on our immune system. A little bit about my career path. Um, so I did my PhD in Tel Aviv University in the Faculty of Life Sciences. Um, I then moved to New York um, for my postdoc. I joined the Rockefeller University, which was a, a phenomenal uh, time for me. And then after uh, I completed my postdoc research, I returned to uh, Tel Aviv University to Sackler Faculty of Medicine, now heading the lab of, um, uh, for human antibody responses. So um, yeah, let's begin. Um, Okay, so severe acute respiratory syndrome stands for SARS. Um, and the picture on the left um, shows these pretty ballerinas and it was taken during uh, the year 2002 during the first outbreak of SARS coronavirus. Um, and the picture on the right is uh, me during my PhD thesis, which was on mapping neutralizing sites on SARS coronavirus. And um, when I was defending my thesis, one of my uh, reviewers uh, half jokingly mentioned that um, who cares about a mild flu that uh, happened in China and disappeared as it came. So this was a little bit insulting for me at the time, but, uh, but I, I, I a little bit agreed with that. But fast forward to the present, March 19, we can see that um, we have another outbreak uh, of a similar virus that looks uh, um, like the first virus, but a little bit different. Um, but now it's global, it's a, a, it's a pandemic. There are over 200,000 confirmed cases. We know that there are more, uh, over 8,000 deaths and uh, they're almost all, all countries are affected. So what, what are these viruses? We were talking about coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are, are actually quite common. Um, amongst us, um, they come from animals. You can see here a phylogenetic tree um, of the viruses, and um, you can see that there are, are alpha viruses and beta viruses. In this um, light, blue, um, light blue box on top, you can see SARS-CoV. This is the virus that was responsible for the outbreak during 2002 and 2003. And then on, on the bottom of the slide, you can see marked again in, in blue shadowed uh, square, the MERS virus, which is another virus from the same family, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And then in the middle of the slide, you can see in red marked the, the new coronaviruses. So the, these are uh, the coronaviruses that cause the outbreak that we are, we are now experiencing. And what you can see first is that the red, the red box is a little bit closer to SARS than to MERS. And this is why the virus uh, got its name, SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and another thing that you can see is that there is another virus that is called bat coronavirus, which is number um, one, two, three, four, five, which is the sixth sequence. Um, and that kind of um, tells us already what, what the origin of this virus is. And we will talk about it a little bit more in, in, in the next slides. So the name of the new coronavirus is SARS coronavirus 2 or SARS CoV 2 shortly. And let's look on the structure of this virus. So this virus is a sphere shaped and it has a genome inside. It carries its genome. The genome is in RNA form. It is a little bit different from our genome, which is DNA. And on the outside, the virus is decorated by these spike proteins. And these spike proteins are the ones that um, uh, gave the virus its name. They, they look a little bit, they make the virus look a little bit like a crown. So that's why it's called coronavirus. 
Now, um, the spike protein has, a, it's not only for decoration, it has actually a very important function in the viral life cycle. And the function is that the spike protein is actually the key that opens the door into the cell. So this is the protein that is responsible for the very first step of infection. Um, the spike protein binds a very specific protein on the surface of the target cells, which is called the ACE2, um, ACE2 receptor. And this ACE2 receptor uh, recognizing the spike is what opens uh, the door into the cell, uh, lets the virus in, and now the virus basically replicates into the, in the cell. It makes uh, the cell, it completely stops the program of the cell, and now um, uh, the cell is only producing more and more viruses, and the end is, uh, is kind of uh, known already, so the viruses, um, there are many progeny viruses that are going out of the cell, and eventually the cell dies, and the viruses infect all the neighboring cells. Okay, so the spike protein also has a very important function in the whole uh, appearance of these viruses and what we, in what we call zoonotic transmission. So um, this slide is a little bit busy, but let's walk through it from the, from the left side and towards the right. So uh, coronaviruses um, reside in bats. Uh, bats can uh, keep them, but they're not getting infected. They're not getting infected because they don't have the right ACE2 receptor. So they, uh, the viruses uh, can stay for many, for long, long periods of time inside the bats. And uh, recent studies actually report that over 6% uh, of all bats in China uh, have coronaviruses. And these viruses um, can be transmitted to another animal that is called civid. You can see it in the center of the slide. It's this, uh, it looks... It looks kind of cute, actually. Uh, so these civets, they hunt for food. And once they, um, they eat a bat, they can um, get a coronavirus. And now the coronavirus can infect the civets because the civets, they do have the right AC2 receptor that can interact with the spike. And um, the virus can enter the cells of the civet. It can replicate there. And when it replicates, it can gain mutations. So once in a while, there is a different uh, virus that carries a different spike protein. Now, um, if a civet infects a human, if a civet uh, by, by eating meat or uh, by bites, um, normally the coronavirus of the civet will not be able to interact with the AC2 receptor of the human. So therefore the coronavirus, the animal coronaviruses cannot infect uh, human cells. However, in very, very rare cases, very small percentage of the cases, when the virus in the civet mutated its spike protein, and then there is a transfer between the civet to the person, this mutated virus can infect AC2 cells in the person, and then the infection starts, and then uh, what happens is what we're witnessing right now. So the virus becomes very, very violent, uh, very infectious, it replicates fast, so it, it, for some reason it gains what we call pathogenicity. It becomes uh, much more severe than its animal variant. So uh, what happens there is an illness that we all uh, have been hearing, hearing about. Uh, you all heard the name uh, uh, COVID-19, but you might not know what it stands for. It stands for Coronavirus-Induced Disease in 2019. Um, the symptoms, I'm sure you all uh, um, saw this graph in many, many variations. In most of the cases, there, there is fever, um, cough, uh, uh, muscle pain. In some rare uh, cases, there is diarrhea and headache. Um, basically, what we call flu-like symptoms. Um, if we divide the population by age, this is the right side of the slide, you can see that uh, all, group, all age groups uh, get infected. Um, and this is based on the infections recorded in Italy and uh, in Korea. Um, however, as, uh, as we can see, uh, the elderly people are more susceptible. Uh, the infection is more, um, is more deadly there. We can see much more deaths in the elderly population. And we can talk about it later, why, why we think this is happening. What about some treatments? So uh, uh, there are several drugs that are being uh, tested. Um, 
These are two potential drugs that are in clinical trials. One is called remdesivir. This is a drug uh, manufactured by Gilead, Gilead Biosciences. It is a drug that originally developed for Ebola treatment. It blocks the replication of the virus once it is already inside the cells. Um, and the second drug is chloroquine. It's another drug that is malaria. So both of these drugs are now in clinical trials. However, the, the biggest advantage of both of them and of other drugs that are tested now um, is that uh, they are not specific to SARS. So uh, that means that they exhibit um, uh, some degree of side effects that now currently blocking them from being approved. So our mission is to develop specific uh, SARS-CoV-2 drugs that uh, will be specific for SARS. And since um, we know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 and CoV-1 are fairly uh, similar, we think that the big advantage of these drugs is that they will be able to also uh, give us um, some sort of a, a weapon to um, attack future outbreaks if this if these can happen. Um, and we, we do expect that this is not the last time we see a zoonotic transfer of the SARS coronaviruses. And what we target is this spike protein, which I just uh, explained about a few slides ago. And more specifically, we are focusing on a, a one region in the spike, which is called the receptor binding domain, or shortly RBD. Um, here you can see um, a movie showing the crystalline structure, the crystal structure of the ACE2 receptor bound to the spike receptor binding domain. And this is a paper that came out in, in science just last week. So they, they did an amazing job to um, elucidate this structure and it was extremely fast. Um, but what you can appreciate here, um, the spike, the SARS protein, the viral protein is on top. Um, it is shown in magenta and the ACE2 receptor is in light blue. And you can appreciate how this interaction is, is uh, specific and uh, it, it's, there is very, really a complementarity between the receptor and, and the virus. And we think that by blocking this interaction, we can uh, block the virus and block the infection. So um, how do we do that? So uh, our, our lab investigates antibodies. Um, and um, I think this is the time to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm going to give one slide, a, a brief primer about how our immune system works, because it's important for, for the next, uh, for, for the remaining slides. So um, if we get a vaccine or if we are infected with a virus, um, our naive cells, immune cells are being stimulated. And one of these cells or if several cells can recognize specifically this virus, and they start uh, dividing and they're expanding. So our naive repertoire basically gives us the ability to recognize many different pathogens, and upon pathogen encounter, these cells that are specific for this pathogen, they begin to replicate and they become stimulated. Now, um, the cells that are specific for the pathogen, they go to a unique, um, anatomical sites, we call them uh, colleges for, for antibodies or, or in their um, real name, germinal centers. And this is where the immune system selects the best uh, cell, the best B cell to fight the virus. So uh, the Ravinian selection is going on there where the cells that exit this germinal center are now uh, really educated and uh, strong and can fight the infection. And they are basically um, now uh, trained and the cells that exit this germinal center are two types of cells. The first type is plasma cell, a cell that secretes antibodies that can now fight the infection, eliminate the pathogen. And the second type of cells are memory B cells. So a memory B cells stay in our body for, for several years, for a very long time. And basically what happens is that um, they retain the memory of the infection and how the immune system uh, fought it. And these are the cells that are the, the basis of uh, vaccination. Um, so in my lab, we investigate memory B cells and we isolate memory B cells from infected patients. And in, in this case, this is particularly 
Uh, I think this has particularly big potential because we know now that the vast majority of uh, COVID-19 patients uh, recover fully from the virus and they do so uh, by themselves without any treatment. So that means that our, the immune system is capable of um, overcoming this virus naturally. So we are interested to understand what are the cells, what, what is the program, what is the immune program to fight this virus. And for that, we use a, a technique that is called single cell sorting. Um, it is a little bit like fishing. So what we are doing, we are um, trying to fish out the specific memory B cells that are against this virus. And uh, in order to, to fish, you need a bait, but uh, um, like, like in real fishing, but instead of using um, worms, we're using a panel of spike proteins um, that we are going to um, uh, mark, we're going to stain them, and then using these spike proteins, we will isolate and fish out the specific memory B cells that are uh, against COVID. And this is a collaboration with uh, my PhD mentor, Professor Jonathan Gershoni, who is also a researcher in Tel Aviv University. So this uh, single cell sorting technology that was developed in my postdoc lab in Rockefeller is a very powerful technique because it really allows us to uh, take the whole collection of cells from the individual and uh, be able to find those uh, extremely relevant, unique memory B cells. And now these memory B cells are being placed one cell in one well. So this is very, very specific and very um, sophisticated technology. The next steps uh, we amplify by PCR um, antibodies from every cell. So for every cell we extract RNA, we make cDNA, and then we amplify the genes of the heavy chain and light chain, which are the two chains comprising a full IgG molecule. We then clone these antibodies into expression vectors. We produce them in the lab. So basically we can produce as many as we want from these antibodies, but the antibodies that we have are natural anti-COVID-19 antibodies that are similar to the ones produced in the patient. And we think that since these antibodies were good enough to overcome the virus in the patient, then we can use them as drugs um, to treat perhaps people who are um, more at risk of infection or people who cannot for some reason produce these antibodies on their own. And of course, another uh, very important application of these antibodies is that they show us what uh, sites of vulnerability exist on the virus and we can use these sites uh, as a as vaccine. So this is really um, a national effort. Um, this project is led by Tel Aviv University, by, by my team. Um, but we um, have a lot of collaborators, mainly hospitals where uh, these corona patients are, um, are hospitalized and we are waiting for them to recover and then we will be collecting their blood and applying our method. And the antibodies will be tested in, um, in vitro for now. There is, there is still not a, not a no good animal model available for, for COVID, but there is an in vitro assay that we will be using to test whether these antibodies can in fact inhibit the virus. Okay, so I would like to summarize now. Um, the new sars cov uh, COVID-2 virus is, is a cousin, a close cousin of the 2002 SARS-CoV outbreak. And zoonotic transmission from bats to civets to humans, this is the, the pathway, um, this is the, uh, the way of the virus to attacking us. Um, the viral spike is the key to initiation of infection, and we think that targeting this interaction is, is a, a, a valid approach to developing specific antiviral drugs. Um, and uh, again, we hypothesize that neutralizing anti-SARS antibodies will be active um, against this virus, but also against future coronaviruses as well. And, and this is my last slide, and I will be very happy to take questions.